Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 777. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's December 13th, 2022. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted, and this is where George and I are in our happy place. We get to sit down in front of our webcams and talk about politics, religion, news around the world, what's ever occurring and fun to us. You'll have to excuse us. I'm in a hotel room right now, and the maid is behind me uh, uh, fluffing the pillows, so uh, ignore any loud noises behind me. George, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I had my first day off in a long time yesterday. Our daughter, Claudia, is going to be visiting us over the Christmas holidays from Seattle. And being a girl in her mid-20s, I need to make sure there's plenty of hot water. (laughs) So I spent the day fixing our hot water heater, uh, putting in, uh, taking out the core, you know, cleaning out the scale, putting in new wiring and uh, exchanging some old uh, rusty pipes for some Pipex, the little flexible plastic ones, some copper. And nobody's dead, and it costs less than if I would have. <laughs> Usually when I do these projects, I wind up breaking stuff, and it costs more uh, than if I had a plumber come and do it. But it cost me less than 40 bucks, so I chalk that up as a day well spent. Well, it is. Every project I ever attempted to do in my house in, in Connecticut was two or three trips to Home Depot. One, to get what I thought I needed. Two, to get what... I thought I needed now three to ask somebody for help <laughs> and that's just a, you know how middle-aged men do their projects on their homes you know you, you think you know what you're doing and I'm glad nobody was hurt you didn't have any submarine issues where something's a pipe is burst or anything well actually I went a little too far with the reciprocating saw and I nicked one of the pipes and it was like a, a scene out of Das Boot or Run Silent, Run sure. Deep, where the yeah. water is squirting everywhere, rising rapidly, and I'm desperately fiddling knobs, trying to shut off valves so the sub doesn't sink to the bottom of the sea. But apart from that, okay. and, but see, then I got to bring out the little spot welder and weld a little uh, sweat, a little copper jacket over where I nicked it. So, you know, hey, playing with fire and... Uh, burning things that made it all worthwhile it does it's fun playing with our toys uh if you can hear me you know that i still have my cold so i still got a little stuffed up nose little congestion sorry about that uh keep me in your prayers uh we're up here at uh mom and dad's this uh, couple weeks as uh, uh dad is moving on to a uh a, a new occupation a, a new place in, in uh outside this world and uh, He's uh, doing really well. He's very comfortable, and uh, it's it, it's a joy to visit with him in these times. George, we got a long list of stories. I'm not sure where to begin. Well, let, let's just start at the top. Uganda TV uh, aired a segment with Archbishop Kazimbi, and he said, and I'm this isn't a quote quote. We are going to break with the Church of England soon. Where did this come from? It's a long time in the making. This goes back to Henry Arambi, two primates ago. Uh, Church of Uganda has uh, broken communion, uh, broken fellowship, all this stuff, various degrees uh, since the, uh, since, oh, for 20 years or so, going on 15 years. Well, uh, Uganda, NGT, the Uganda, did a a magazine show, uh, one of these six-minute news piece, which we posted up on Anglican Inc. And in there, uh, Stephen Kazimbi says, basically, we've reached the final straw, the last straw, and that's the appointment of Keith Monteith. Kevin Monteith? Keith Monteith? Dean Monteith as the Dean of Canterbury, a partnered gay man. And the Church of Uganda, the actual quote was, we will soon disconnect our souls from them, from the Church of England. The Church of Uganda leader believes the Church of England's leadership is taking that branch of Christ's kingdom straight to perdition, refusing to speak the truth, refusing to stand for the faith once delivered by the saints instead of instead doing temporizing measures, half measures, 
not being quite clear, or being just downright disingenuous. Example, uh, it was announced uh, yesterday that uh, Paul Kennington will be the new interim dean of Chelmsford. So what? Kennington had been the dean of Montreal, Christ Church Cathedral Montreal, for about 10 years. And when he retired, he's English, he went home to England. And he came home with his husband. He, When he was in Canada, he married his civil partner. And while he was the dean of Christ Church Cathedral, he would give these sermons extolling how gay sex can be a form of God's holiness and God's love, and it is perfectly moral and good and true. And he made no fiddling remarks about being uh, in a non-sexual uh, relationship in his civil partnership. This was a marriage for him. He did not well, claim to be chaste. Yeah. And he goes back to England, and he's given a job in the Diocese of Chelmsford, house for duty priest. He's given a place to live in retirement. And I asked the Bishop of Chelmsford at the time, 2017, do you have any problems? Because this man has said he is non-celibate in his partner relationship. And the spokesman for the uh, Bishop, Art, uh, Bishop Cottrell, who, or Cottrell, is, who is now the Archbishop of York, said, well, uh, his life leads is uh, lived according to the standards set down by the Church of England. So, which is, don't ask, don't tell, I don't know what it is, but, you know, he's in a partner, he's a civil part. it's marriage in Canada, civil partnership in England. It's sexual in Canada, I guess it's too cold in, in England, or the water, something funny in the water, it's not sexual in England. And now he's been appointed interim dean for the next year or so by the new bishop of Chelmsford, who supposedly is on the evangelical side of the, of the line. And what, what we're saying here is the tracks are laid. The tracks are laid. Somebody who should be, by their own words, disqualified from senior office in the Church of England because they are living a life outside of that permitted by the church is appointed a dean of a cathedral. And it's now a, a so what story. And so when the Church of England says, we will disconnect ourselves from them, they truly believe that the Church of England's leadership is no longer Christian. I, that, I don't think that could not be argued. Uh, clearly, uh, the government of England is taking a look at whether or not there should be a House of Lords. Uh, yeah. and clearly, uh, Minier and East put out a piece two weeks ago that said, uh, if you go down this road, we're going to have to find new leadership for the Anglican Communion. The See of Canterbury will no longer be the default head of the, uh, uh, uh in leadership. And so we're to the point now that the lying church, the, the Church of England who's been lying to itself and to us for the last 10 years is sick of telling lies and now yeah, they're telling kevin, the truth kevin you mentioned the house of lords that's one example um gordon brown the former prime minister uh has put uh chaired a commission chartered by the labor party uh looking at the constitutional future of britain and what and they made 40 recommendations one of them is the abolition of the house of lords and replace it with an elected senior chamber whether it's a senate or something like that but a second elected senior with fewer members and this and that. And that would mean getting rid of the House of Lords, which would mean expelling bishops from government. Well, Alan Smith, the Bishop of St. Albans, the convener of the Lord's Spiritual, the head of the Lords, head of the bishops in the House of Lords, says this is a terrible mistake, uh, that, you know, we do a good job, we just need to sort of clean up our act a bit. But he then went on to say that and besides, we need people with the voice, with religious sense, faith sensibilities in positions of government to represent those who have no voice. And the conceit, the, the two problems with this, Kevin, you picked this one right up. Well, it'd be nice if they talked about faith issues in government, but they don't. They don't. <laughs> uh, they don't. They're, they're doing politics all the time. And, but second, it's the conceit that only bishops can speak on matters of faith. Everybody else is ignorant, or religion only matters to the professionals. Um, America does a good job without with its clergy kept far, far as possible 
from the seats of power and government as it should be. Um, but if and the Keir, uh, I want to say Keir Hardy, uh, that the, the Labour Party leader uh, <laughs> is uh, is saying once we are in power and given the unpopularity of the Tory government, the let's election they may take power. What's won't be our first things uh, abolishing the Lords. Huh. So the 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 the. The, the bishops of the Church of England's their attempt to hold on to authority, to power, to privilege is failing and collapsing around their eyes. And given the opportunity to speak about issues of faith and morals, they don't. Well, this week, the College of Bishops uh, in the Church of England are meeting to discuss LLF, living love and fraud, faith. And uh, I thought, you know, we'd talk about that as well because you posted a lot of stories on Anglican.inc this week that, uh, that you. That's me. You, <laughs> that's all right. That's not uh, Jay Welby, is it? No. And so you posted a, lo a lot of stories this week uh, on Anglican.inc about people writing their suggestions to the College of Bishops. Yeah, from Jan Oz Jane Ozan to uh, Roz Clark of the Church Society. there, And we put something out from uh, Gafcon Isle of Wight, a very cogent statement from a priest there, mm -hmm. basically advising the bishops how to go forward on this. Um, because on Monday and today, the bishops are going to basically formulate their approach on gay marriage for discussion and debate at the next meeting of the Church of England's General Synod in the beginning of February. So uh, remember a few weeks ago, there was the uh, uh, deliberately leaked story into the church times that the bishops agree something has to be done. We have to come up with something to change the status quo, which of course was the liberal sort of incremental process. Yes. And so we've got, uh, five, we've got two dioceses and bishops pushing gay marriage, Worcester, Oxford and Worcester, Plus, there's their assistants and suffragans are on board. You know, they follow their boss. And then we have Southwark, Southwark uh, as it's spelled, uh, saying, well, he's not in favor of gay marriage, but he's in favor of gay blessings, uh, but not calling it marriage, blessing civil unions. And we've not had, and we've had evangelical groups and prominent leaders pushing the other direction, but the conservative bishops are silent. They basically, absent uh, without leave in this fight and so all these things are going on and out of this meeting will come something mm -hmm. now justin welby when he was in <clears throat> kiev last week uh told the times of london in response to a question he will not share his beliefs on gay marriage so long as he remains in office and if you pause for a moment uh just think about what that means um He's not willing to say anything, but he's willing to countenance the appointment of a partnered gay man as the head of the deployment for the bishops, as the dean of Canterbury, uh, now the dean of Chelmsford, all this stuff. So that, And do we see any conservative evangelicals or Anglo-Catholics appointed as diocesan bishops? No, no. we don't. No, but no. here, J Justin Welby said, don't judge me by my words, judge me by my actions. Right. Well, it's not a quote, but if you're telling me you're not going to tell, give your opinion on uh, important topics in the church, I'll just have to watch what you do. And, and then the, what Welby said was that he sees himself as a focal point or a foci of unity. And that idea that he's some sort of misty, magical symbol like the crown in Britain, uh, independent of person, but, you know, the office of the archbishop is this magical point where we all come together that's so presumptuous and anti-historical because if you look at the Anglican, for Anglican formularies if you look at the whole ethos and tradition of Anglicanism what Justin Welby is saying has no place in the Anglican world the Archbishop of Canterbury is not some demigod who must remain quiet so that everybody else feels happy in the room. He's the Archbishop of Canterbury, the head of the province of 
Canterbury, the primate of all England, and he also has the charism of Episcopacy, where he's supposed to teach and uphold the faith once received. But he says that must be subordinated to this idea that I, Justin, have of being some magical person who must be above it all. The man's a loon. I'm sorry. He's a loon. Well, he doesn't know his theology. He doesn't know his church history. He's basically either been tied up in knots by his lawyers or he really believes his madness. Well, it's hard to tell because he took an oath of office when he became a bishop. And part of that was to defend the faith and to guide and, and remove the church from errors. And drive off all strange and erroneous yeah, doctrines. Yeah, yeah, and so we have strange and erroneous doctrines, uh, you know, cultivating the, the whole Anglican communion. And it's his job to say that is strange and erroneous. We will not, we will not pursue that. We will uh, spell it out. Yeah, you know, spew and, it out. Okay, let's say, okay, we'll give him a break on gay marriage. Maybe he hasn't made up his mind. But last week, for instance, he was asked to comment by Fox News on the uh, transgender Jesus. He couldn't, he, he didn't respond, no comment, nothing to say. But he's got plenty to say on government immigration policy. He's got plenty to say on banking policy. He's got, you know, he uses, he abuses his ecclesial office for left, center left political purposes. The sort of the, the guardian, editorial page worldview or now the times editorial page worldview mm -hmm. they've moved to the left that is just offensive to those who seek out of their church leaders the teachings that will lead to eternal life and salvation what is this man thinking i don't know well here, here's what kevin is thinking here's my opinion uh same-sex marriage was a bridge too far we had for a while here in America civil partnerships that seemed to be working just fine. The second we went on a, at a, on a legal basis to uh, a nation that endorsed and affirmed uh, same-sex marriage, we we opened a Pandora's box. We have uh, children attending drag queen shows. We have uh, groomers uh, just going into our public schools left and right and uh, telling the children they don't have to tell their parents if they have a different pronoun. And they, they get all this junk all day long where uh, we used to in the 90s, uh, I tell my kids about stranger danger. Stranger danger now is a public school. That's the Pandora's box we opened up, George. And we're also entering, we're also giving space for the demonic world hold over our children our culture and our society yeah. the normalization of pornography that the uh the normal normalization of deviancy in these drag show programs where kirk cameron the uh star of a of a 1980s sitcom as a child actor later became an evangelical christian and has produced some of these left behind movies um he's written a children's christian children's book and he's sought out uh, to re where they have reading hour, where you can read a book to children. And he went to uh, libraries across the nation that have promoted drag queen story hours at public libraries and offered to read his book. And he's had 50 libraries tell him, no, we, we can't allow you to read something that is uh, biblical morals, but we will allow drag queens to come and gyrate their uh, pelvic areas to five-year-olds. Uh, in in the uh, quest for self identity and exploration, uh, this is demonic. This is sick. Yeah. In fact, our next story involves what should happen when somebody exposes himself to children. George, a Uganda priest, got twenty eight years for having sex with a minor. That's about right. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 it was a girl too. I mean. Uh, what was his name? Gordon Mwesi was a uh, church of Uganda vicar, and he seduced one of the young girls in his congregation. And the parents found out, and they brought a complaint to the police and to the church, and Gordon was put on trial. He was found guilty of statutory rape. And guess what his sentence was? 
28 years. years. Awesome. <laughs> that should be a With minimum the, sentence. <laughs> well, you know, basically it's three or four times what the normal sentence is, but it was pointed out that he had a higher duty not to <laughs> corrupt the morals of the children under his care, but to help them uh, perfect their morals. So two, two, two things to take away. Sometimes we romanticize churches over there that they've got no clergy problems. Every church has got its Absolutely. bad apples everywhere. Yeah. But there are some churches that seek to really punish their bad apples uh, rather than uh, promote them to deans or, uh, or, or hide what they've done and excuse them or say, you know, I know nothing about Jonathan Smythe and John, you know, John, Jonathan Fletcher and John Smythe. I know nothing. I know nothing. Rather than do that, they clean up their acts in the Church of oh. Uganda. Kevin, remember how unpopular we were for about a month with the uh, Church of yeah. Uganda rank and file because we broke the story that the uh, arch former archbishop had been disciplined for adultery? Mm -hmm. um, they're willing. The Church of Uganda really is willing to walk the walk and talk the talk. Yeah. Um, well, uh, church in Nigeria, well, the Church of Nigeria has a story this week they're probably not proud of. One of their bishops, uh, uh, who we talked about before, he's a pros uh, prosperity gospel warrior, uh, has decided that uh, God told him to take a church, take an act of church, and kick out them white devils. And so uh, here in New Jersey, we have quite a story going on, George. Well, it's fascinating. There are some African politicians, I'm thinking of Julius Malemba in South Africa, who they killed the white man, killed the kill, boar. Kill, kill the white man, yeah. Little did we know that one of those politicians had become a bishop of the church in Nigeria. Well, uh, two Sundays ago at Christ Church in Irvington, New Jersey, that is a parish predominantly of Nigerian immigrants of Igbo extraction, that a year ago left the Church of Nigeria in North America and joined the ACNA uh, under the Diocese of the Rocky Mountains. Bishop Tom Ross, Bob, Bob uh, Ross, Ross is the guy Ken, with the... I thought Ken it was Ross. Ken Ross. Not, Ken Ross yeah. Okay, <laughs> Bob Ross is the guy with the fuzzy hair in the painting yes, show. Yes, yes. Not him, no. uh, but Bishop Ross. Well, Bishop Ross was doing a visitation. And... I want to tread lightly because I've not been able to confirm this. I've got a soul source. And when you only go on a soul source, you just take your life in your hands. You do. Yes. A press release was put out by a new entity of which I was unaware that is uh, tied to the, the jurisdiction for chaplaincy and armed forces of the ACNA. And their recounting of the story is Bishop Ross was warned to stay away from this parish by the current head of the Church of Nigeria in America, since Felix Orji joined the ACNA. Mm -hmm. And he was warned that there might be some sort of confrontation. Well, Bishop Ross visited his parish. Good. And during the service, a suffragan in this Church of Nigeria in America, Augustine Nwigbe, along with 14 others, entered the church, disrupted the service, and tried to, and asked called upon the police to arrest this pro-gay bishop who was stealing this, this white man who's stealing a church from these peaceful Africans. And the YouTube videos show Uigbe hitting a person on the head with his crozier. Now, it's one thing for St. Nicholas to punch a heretic. Uh, heretics, but aren't, but her heretics aren't allowed to hit punch. You know, yeah, he... Why do we say... A few years ago, when Owigbe was up for being a suffragan bishop in the uh, AC, uh, in uh, the Church of Nigeria uh, in the U.S., Matt Kennedy ran a series of articles which we covered, pointing out that Owigbe was a firm devotee advocate of the prosperity gospel, the name mm -hmm. and claim it. God wants you to be rich. He will, re if you are rewarded, that's what you seek when you worship the Lord Jesus Christ to hit the lotto, hit the jackpot. That's a sign of God's love and favor. That, of course, is utter nonsense and heretical. It's a but heresy, Wigbe, but it, it's a but it's a common heresy in Africa. It's not that based. You know, it's been imported from the United States. Yeah, yes, it it has made its way to the United from the United States, and it is 
infesting portions. And it's proving to be a struggle because for African churches, according to seminary leaders in Africa whom, with whom I've spoken on this issue, because these guys, students look around and they see these pastors becoming rich and having huge crowds promising people, God, I will shower God's blessings upon you, you know. And we make, oh, oh, those ignorant people. Well, turn on the 700 Club. And when Pat Robertson puts his hands up and you, you put your hands to match his, you'll get 10,000 for every 1,000 you give. It's straight out of the U.S. And it's being and it's being Africanized. Well, Iwigbe was one of these people, even though he's a medical doctor who lives in New Jersey, Atlantic City, I believe. And a formal complaint was made. And the Church of Nigeria sort of wanted to finesse the thing. They told a way better to cut it out, but they went ahead with this consecration anyway. Now he's returned uh, in new guise, accusing Bishop Ross of being pro-gay, of uttering just really offensive racial, racial remarks that the, the white man is trying to steal this church and whatnot. Um, and we'll see if the Church of Nigeria takes action and investigates this um you yeah, know i can well, say this this is scandalous and shameful this this should result in a formal complaint sent by the acna to the church of uganda but on the misconduct which is captured on television mm -hmm. which was the Irvington police, there were police there, and I think they warned Buig Bay, and it may result in a trespass charge or something. So this is not just, if if I understand this press release properly, this is not just a he said, he said, she said. This is a clear case on film and for the police of uh, gross misconduct. But th oh. this is why I'm so... This is why I wish we could get Bishop Ross on the record and others on the record. I even tried the ACNA, and they said, well, it sounds, I, I talked to their press people, and off the record, they said, well, it sounds right, but, you know, you really need to talk to the source, and I've been trying, but no yeah. dice. No dice. So if I'm completely wrong, then I owe Augustine to Wig Bay a full and total apology. Yeah, um, you're pretty safe on this, because the video shows what we're talking about. You know, and so it's one of those. It's one of those things where, uh, right now, the relationships between the ACNA and the Church of Nigeria are at its worst. Uh, you know, we recently had the uh, uh, Bishop Orji come on board with the ACNA and uh, uh, tell about the struggle he had in the Church of England, uh, in the Church of Nigeria, and so here we are. And uh, this is this is just a black eye. For both the ACNA well, it, and the Church of Nigeria. Well, it's a leadership issue. It yeah. doesn't affect the vast majority of the Church of Nigeria or the ACNA. It just affects those people who should be monitoring the activities of its leaders, meaning its bishops. On a related story, Diocese of Toronto puts Jesus in a cage for some political purpose. <laughs> Oh, Kevin, the, this is that time of year where Time Magazine will put out a cover story. Did Jesus really exist? Was mm -hmm. there a virgin bird? You know, we'll get all that. And and then we'll have some, uh, oh, uh, Vox or one of these online news services selling us, well, you know, Christianity really is a pagan ceremony that was taken over. And you'll get all these fake stories coming out. And then you'll get these virtue signaling stories. And we have a perfect one from the Diocese of Toronto. Um, and in fact, I'm amazed that some American dioceses haven't done this already, but kudos to the Canadians for being ahead of the curve on the woke index. They have a statue of homeless Jesus. That was sort of in vogue a few years ago. Uh, sort of having a statue of Jesus, meek and mild, but dressed sort of like a hobo and putting it outside of offices and buildings and things. Well, this year they've decided to put a cage around homeless Jesus to protest what they call the police cruelty to the unhoused and the undocumented in their communities. 
I love these euphemisms. The homeless are not called the unhoused. The undocuments are used to be called illegal aliens. And so they're basically putting Jesus in a cage, just like the city and police of Toronto are putting the unhoused in a cage of persecution in Toronto. No, well, I'm surprised they uh, didn't offer uh, Jesus in a cage the cocktail of drugs to uh, kill himself. Very popular thing to do now in Canada, George. 10,000 people 10, uh, euthanized. Um, well, the Nazis only euthanized 40,000 uh, mentally ill children before the yeah. war. Yeah. So maybe the Canadians are... They're onto something, wanna, apparently. You know, it's, it's interesting because, it, once again, it's a bridge too far that we talked about. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, Canada had uh, decided that we're going to have doctor-assisted suicide, uh, Kevorkian style. And now people who are having trouble finding homes or getting government assistance are getting letters from the government saying, we can't put in a new staircase for your wheelchair or ramp for your wheelchair, but we can offer you, and this is an actual letter, assisted suicide. Oh, a bridge Canada. too far. <laughs> yes, oh, Canada. <laughs> oh, Canada, where have, what has happened to you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Again, it's, it's, it's not all of Canada, far from it. No. But... As in the United States, there's a Looney Tune streak that is mm -hmm. coming out, and we just happen to have a decrepit, senile Looney Tune in charge instead of a young, vacuous Looney Tune in charge. <laughs> All right, so the last two or three weeks, we talked about China and their crackdown on Christians, uh, you know, especially the technology involved in doing so. Uh, we noted that the uh, Apple has given. Uh, the Chinese government a special code to lock on to the uh, uh, iPhones of protesters. Now they have implemented the you can't turn off your GPS on your iPhone uh, system so that when they show up to a protest, there's a digital signature that you were there. Uh, it's just getting worse and worse, George. Yeah, well, I don't mind it because while my daughter's traveling in India, she's in Calcutta, I know exactly where she is because I've turned on the GPS because I pay for her iPhone. Darn doon. Well, the, the Chinese government have gotten Apple, and this was this has been a practice for a while, to uh, basically remove user controls about location. If you have an iPhone, it, sometimes you'd be asked, do you want location monitoring? Questions not asked to China. And who is monitoring you is the government. Uh, we've reported about the unrest uh, breaking up across China, how we say it could go one or two directions, crack down or uh, uh, loosening. And it's go doing both. They're removing some COVID restrictions, but in at the same time, instead of rounding up the people in the street, beating them with batons, because they have the... Uh, iPhone information of everybody whose iPhone showed being in a certain area at a certain time, they just arrest you at three in the morning with a knock on the door. Guilty by the association. Thing, so even, even if you were just, you know, I don't know, yet working at the night shift across the street from the protest, you get scooped up. Yeah. You get scooped. Uh, the, uh, I also mentioned how religion, organized religion is usually one of the casualties in these intensification campaigns. And sources in China have basically sent pictures and photos of a new poster campaign. Now, uh, poster campaigns have been a part of Chinese government policy for a long time and were especially prominent during the Cultural Revolution, sort of to sense the direction in which ways were going. Those people who were soon to be purged from leadership would appear in posters and ridiculed. Well, a this new campaign is based on the popular Korean Japanese manga type comics. You know, the characters with the big eyes and all this and that. Um, well, these series of posters, then I was sent pictures of them uh, with translations of what the characters said, are basically warning people against being involved in cults, anti cults posters. Now, in the United States, when we say cults, we're thinking about Scientology or Moonies. Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, Witnesses. Scientology. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but in China, that basically means anybody outside the party's official worldview. 
Mm -hmm. And so there's this one poster ridiculing people who pray for the sick, saying, trust science, trust the party. Um, these could have been written by Dr. Fauci himself. Is Fauci an suppose, Asian name? But, I think Fauci is an Asian name. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, Eastern Italy, not Eastern yeah, okay. <laughs> Asia. Uh, but the... Uh, but the basically the these this poster anti-religious poster campaigns are coming back the up the modernization is using manga style characters and uh graphics but it's the same met same uh message that we saw in uh, the 1960s and 70s in the crackdown on religion and and meanwhile in hong kong Google, uh, you can't, can't leave Google out when Apple's being beaten up for being pro-communist. Google has been asked by the government there to sort of censor uh, searches for this popular pro-democracy pop song that's all the rage among the teeny boppers. Shadow ban. And Google, yeah. Yeah, Google is complying with state requests to downplay access to uh, popular media and entertainment for the young people that uh, is anti that could be construed as being anti-party so the machine in china is gradually loosening up its hold on COVID lockdowns um but at the same time it's stamping out dissent and uh i just well i feel very badly that this is going to be a dark time for the people of China. Yeah. Christian yeah, and non-Christian. Yeah. It, much persecution coming because it doesn't look like the leader is stepping down anytime soon. Every week there's another rumor that the drought will take him down, that the financial situation in China will take him down, that the real estate uh, uh, bubble will take him down. But he's firmly in power and uh, he will be there for a while until he dies. And a lot of people well, will die because he's in power. Remember, under the Mao's Great Leap Forward at the end of the 50s, early 60s, I think 50 million people starved to death. 58. Uh, yeah. And the, go and the government functionaries basically would lie to this people up in the head. Of Is there a crisis? Oh, no crisis. Everything's going fine. Um, it's the same, the same structures in place that allowed 50 million people to die from famine are in place today. And I'm not saying 50 million people will die of famine, but the people do not matter to the no. leaders in charge. Welfare is not the issue. Trust the party. All right, our final story is about downsizing. Uh, as you know, uh, Jill and I downsized from a condo on the shore in Milford, Connecticut to an RV. It seems the Diocese of Oregon is downsizing from their $43 million property headquarters to something that's more appropriate for the times, George. Yeah, this is in South Portland, a suburb, and it was given to the diocese, I think, in the 50s or 60s. A beautiful mansion with grounds and everything. It's huge, yeah. And the, money, and the money to keep it up, too. So uh, it's not falling apart. Diocese of Connecticut had a huge, beautiful building downtown, but they had no money to maintain it. Mm -hmm. And it looked like it was going to fall down at one point. Um, but they're getting rid of this. The new bishop wants to sell it and uh, pocket the money to keep the diocese afloat. Um, Sign of the times. Yeah, uh, sign of the times. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a shame because, you know, if they really think they're in it for the long haul, they should probably hold on. For, unless they're going to use this money wisely to invest in growth and opportunity, which I will guarantee you they will not do. They'll hire three or four diversity officers and uh, this or that. Um, you should hold on to these assets for future for the future generations. Oh, absolutely! Um, I mean, not just that; it could you could be making income off it as a conference center or an Airbnb of some sort, bed and breakfast. Uh, uh, that is a huge asset that was donated to the church by a couple who had this uh, huge property. They, they needed to unload or will away, and uh, they had no intention for the church to sell it as an asset. So. Well, you know, Newark just sold its property to the, I think, the local arts or Philharmonic. Um, mm -hmm. Chicago is trying to sell its property. And if it does so, it'll basically bankrupt the cathedral. 
uh, because the income, uh, the diocese is basically saying, well, we'll take the lion's share of the income, uh, which we're not going to share with the cathedral, and that's going to put them under the uh, underwater. Yeah. Um, now, it's one thing to sell property that is no longer uh, efficient or useful and invest in a new property or do... This is this is stripping of assets. This is liquidating property to have the cash because you're not generating income. It's not liquidating a not performing asset to invest in a new performing asset. If you Correct. understand where I'm yeah. going. Yeah. So th th these are the signs of a organization in terminal decline, not an organization in growth. Nope. All right, that's this week's episode of Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 777 of Anglican Unscripted.